All right, so is everybody here for the introduction to JavaScript class? Because I just want to make sure no one's here by mistake for some other reason. Okay, good. All right. So, introduction to JavaScript. Who here has heard of JavaScript before? Everybody just, okay. How many of you have actually coded in JavaScript before? One, two, okay. So we got a few people that, that are gonna be able to correct me on all the things that I get wrong, that's good. Uh, all right, so before I get started on JavaScript, I kinda wanna talk about programming. Most of you guys are already programmers, so most of you already have had some time in programming. But I kinda wanna talk a little bit about programming in general first. And some of you may already know who this gentleman is. You guys heard of this name, Alan Turing? Okay. There was a video, a movie, not too long ago, uh, starring Benedict Cumberbatch, about Alan Turing and his defeat of the Enigma machine. Okay. He, re he gained a lot of notoriety because he did this. He was the first person to develop what we would consider to be code for an electronic computer. Okay. Before that, there were some other people that actually had done some coding. We'll talk a little bit about that here in just a moment. But Alan Turing is probably one of the most famous programmers that there has been in history. Really kind of the grandfather of programming. Now, back in 1946, after he gained some notoriety for breaking Enigma, he was asked to do a lecture. And the lecture is on the automatic computing machine. So back in 1946, he was asked to have a talk and one of the interesting things he said during this lecture was, in order to supply the machine with these problems, we shall need a great number of mathematicians of ability. Now think about that. Most of us have done some programming, some coding. Do we consider ourselves mathematicians? Hmm. It kind of gives a certain connotation to what type of individual is required to do coding and to do software, right? If we think about a coder or developer in today's world, do we typically think it's kind of for nerds and geeks and just people who've got nothing better to do with their time than to spend it in front of the computer, right? Well, who played D&D, &D, right? <laughs> D &D, right? Yeah. Uh, so I didn't actually do D&D. &D. I was Magic the Gathering guy. Yeah. Uh, so, I kind of want to jump to women in computer programming because I think that um, women have had an incredible contribution to the computing world and I think that it deserves some identification here. And I'm going to start out with Ada Lovelace. Ada Lovelace was actually the first programmer. She was the first person to take a mechanical machine enter in a set of instructions and receive an output. She's the first one to do it. Our very first programmer was Ada Lovelace. Have a seat right here. Now, that's pretty significant, I think. The second person that I'd like to introduce you to is Grace Hopper. Anybody heard the name Grace Hopper? Very, very influential because without her, very raised hand. <laughs> So Grace Hopper invented the first compiler. Who's heard the word compiler before? Okay, good. So a lot of people know what a compiler is. For those of you who don't know what a compiler is, essentially you can think of it as, I'm going to take this human readable language, something that I can read and I can write very easy, kind of like an English language kind of thing. And I'm going to have it interpret I'm going to have it encoded into machine language. So I'm going to take this human readable code and I'm going to convert that to something the computer can read. That was a major, major contribution because now do we need the mathematicians of great ability to write code? Right. That was a significant contribution. And I'm, I know this is going to, I just, it's a woman that did this. Women have been in this industry for a very long time. And in fact, in the 1960s, approximately 40 to 50% of programmers were women. 
And you think about the 1960s. Does this sound like a matriarchal society in the 1960s? Not really. But women were doing a lot of the programming. Okay? So I just kind of wanted to show that. I, I think that's a very interesting fact that women have been very, very influential in the evolution of programming. So let's move on. That's another history lesson for today. Let's actually talk about introduction to JavaScript. All right, so about me, who am I? This is this guy, Steve. I started developing when I was 15. I don't have a calendar date circled or anything like that to tell you it was January. I might have been 14. Can't really tell you for sure. But I think it was around 15 years old I started to do development. And I started out in something called MIRC. Have you heard of MIRC? Okay. Have you heard of IRC? Internet Relay Chat. Okay. MIRC is the main application for PCs that you actually do communication with IRC. And I used to write a lot of scripts for MIRC. Pretty cool. So I love to code, but I love to talk about code even more. So that's why I am a teacher instead of just a coder. I've been doing coding for several years, but I just decided I'd rather talk to you lovely people than to actually sit in front of the computer and doing it. So I have a YouTube channel with uh, 32,000 subscribers as of right now. There might be more. Maybe when you get home, it'll be 33. I don't know. I average about, <laughs> about 1,200 new subscribers every month. So it's growing. Uh, the channel, in case you guys want to go to it, is programmingmadeeasy.com. Or for all those people who are in a foreign country like Great Britain, Australia, Canada, it's programmingmadeez. Right. Uh, okay. I'm also a former golf instructor. So if you guys like to talk golf, I can talk golf with you. So what you guys will need, what you'll need for this uh, little talk that we're going to do here, if you don't already have it, please find a computer. It needs to work. We're not going to be doing any computer repair in this classroom. So uh, please make sure that it is operational. You'll need a code editor, sometimes referred to as an IDE. A code editor, the one that I would recommend is Visual Studio Code, but there's other ones out there, Atom, Eclipse. Uh, I like Visual Studio Code because it is cross-platform. You can run it on Mac, you can run it on Linux, you can run it on PC. I will be using Visual Studio Code for this demonstration, by the way, too. So you guys will actually see that. Uh, some HTML knowledge. It's not required, but it is certainly helpful, okay? Because we will be interacting with some of the HTML objects on a web page. And you need determination. That seems kind of cliche, I know, but I think it, this industry requires a lot of thought. And I'm going to say that there is a difference between a coder and a programmer, or a coder and a developer. A coder, to me, is somebody who knows how to code. You know, variables, functions, objects, types, that sort of thing. But a lot of us, we know the English language, but we're not writers. We're not professional writers. We don't write novels. Okay? To be able to do development and programming and not just be a coder, I think you really need to take some hard steps towards doing your profession in a very well-crafted manner, okay? So it takes a lot of determination to do what you want the code to do uh, and learning more and more, because this industry is just continuing to grow with new innovations all the time. So let's talk about the parts of a web page. First, we have HTML, hypertext markup language. You guys have probably heard of that before. I hope most of you guys have heard of that before. Okay, and HTML is really just the objects that make up a web page. Okay, so we have, I don't know if you guys can see that, but there are, there's a box here which represents the web page. We have another box there, another box there, and another box there. And that's just kind of representing the objects that make up a web page. Now, CSS stands for Cascade Style Sheets, and that's really what formats 
gives the characteristics of the objects on the web page. So HTML defines the objects. CSS kind of gives the characteristics and the formatting of those objects. Things like color, size, okay? You can even move things around with it. It's pretty cool. Now, JavaScript is the coding language. And JavaScript is the language that browsers use to create interactive effects with those objects on a web page. So you're creating the interactions between the user and the page. So we have represented there, I guess, by the flashes, and we can resize things, we can move things around, you can click on things, so it's user interaction, okay? Together, these three things, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript really comprise up of front-end development, okay, so that your users use to look at your page. So what is JavaScript? JavaScript is a programming language used to make web pages interactive. We just talked about that, right? Now, JavaScript is an interpreted language. It's, an, it's a scripting language for the browser. Okay? The browser actually takes this language and does something with the web page based upon the code you wrote. Okay? So it runs on the client's browser, but it can also run on the server, but that's a whole other topic. Okay, there's something called Node.js, which actually takes JavaScript code, but we're not going to talk about Node.js here. This is strictly we're going to talk about the client side, the, what runs in the browser. Now, JavaScript is object-based, but I hesitate to say that it is object-oriented. Has anybody heard of the term object-oriented programming? Okay. This is a very fine line that we're talking about here. And I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but essentially JavaScript has objects in it, but the language itself is not geared towards working with those objects as in we're going to uh, create types and we're going to have certain structures and classes and things like that, okay? It's really about, we have an object, what are we going to do with it? Now, you can write object-oriented like, uh, object JavaScript. So that's kind of the fine line we're, we're walking here. But if somebody tells you that JavaScript is an object-oriented language, it can be if you write it in a particular way. It's really something we call functional. It is a functional language. OK. It's dynamically typed, which essentially means if you write a variable, which we'll get into variables a little bit later, but JavaScript doesn't need you to tell it what kind of variable it is. Just that there is a variable. You don't need to tell it this is a, a number. You don't need to tell it this is text. You don't need to tell it this is an object. It's just going to figure all that out all by itself. Okay. So what JavaScript is not? It's not Java. I'm sure you've probably heard that already. If you've heard anything about JavaScript, the first thing people complain about is it's not Java. Okay. JavaScript is not compiled. So the thing we were talking about with, uh, um, oh, now I've, of course I've forgotten who it is. Grace Hopper. Grace Hopper, thank you very much. Uh, Grace Hopper invented the compiler. JavaScript is not compiled. It's actually interpreted by the browser. We're talking Edge, Ex the Edge Internet Explorer, Mozilla Firefox, Safari. Those browsers actually take the code and interpret it to do things. So it's not compiled down into machine language. It's just interpreted by the browser to do whatever you want it to do. Okay? JavaScript is not statically typed, which is what we were talking about where I can just say, I'm just going to declare a variable here. I'm not going to tell you what kind it is. And then JavaScript is not even called JavaScript. Which one? It's called ECMAScript. ECMA, ECMA, is a, is a body of people that took over the versioning and development of JavaScript. And they renamed it ECMAScript when they took it over. Now, we still call it JavaScript. We still call it that, because that's what we've all come to know it as. But technically, it's owned and managed by ECMA. So we call it ECMAScript, but 
It's really JavaScript. I know. It's kind of weird. All right, so pop quiz. Pop quiz time. What are the three core languages in building web pages? Anybody want to take a shot at that? Yes. HTML. Okay. CSS. Uh huh. JavaScript. Good job. Here we go. Rub it up. <laughs> All right. Next one. Is JavaScript a compiled language? No. No, it is not. Okay. Where does JavaScript run? In the browser. In the browser. Perfect. Okay. Script tag. All right, we're starting to get to the good stuff now. Script. We have a script. Okay. You guys see that red dot? I don't know if you can see that red dot. Mm -hmm. All right. It's my laser pointer. It's on my phone. So we have the script tags. These are HTML tags that actually define where our JavaScript is inside of the HTML. So it can be placed, these script tags can be placed either in between the head tags or the body tags. Please tell these nice ladies are able to join us. Hi there. Sorry we, don't, we ran out of space for tables. I hope you guys can just use your laptops. Yeah. That's why they call them laptops, right? Okay. So you guys are actually just in time because I got done with all the BS stuff that, you know, the precursor stuff, like what you got to have. Uh, give you all my personal information, my social security number, my credit cards. We missed all that. <laughs> so, script tags are where we actually define. Uh, this is the HTML code that we're going to put in our page that actually says, okay, starting from this point to this point, everything in between is going to be code. Okay? So, that's those script tags can be placed between either the head tags or the body tags of an HTML document, okay? And I'll be showing you guys this in just a bit, so don't worry if it's not quite clicking, you guys are actually gonna see it. It's very important to me that you guys see the visual, you guys hear it, and you guys also do it, okay? So hear it, see it, do it. Really want that to be important to you guys. Uh, can be placed between header tags, or head tags and body tags. It's used for the actual placement of the JavaScript inside of a web page. Okay, I gotta remember, I'm not pointing at the screen, I gotta use my laser pointer so everybody online can see that I'm talking about used for placement of JavaScript inside of the web page. Okay, so that's what the script tags do, is they really kind of declare this is where the script is. Now the SRC attribute, the source attribute on a script tag is used to indicate the location of a JavaScript file. And what's really cool about this, and what I'm going to just talk about here for a moment, is that you can actually write your JavaScript in a separate file from your HTML file. So if I've got an HTML file that I'm doing all my HTML tags with, I can have a completely separate file that's my JavaScript. And I use this SRC attribute on the script tags to define where it can find that JavaScript file. And so it's going to look something like this. I don't know if everybody can see that. It's probably not the right color here because it's kind of dark, but script src equals and then the path to where that JavaScript file is. And it's uh, JavaScript extension is going to be .js. So if you're going to make your JavaScript in a file, you're going to want to put the extension of .js. And you can see this is just going to now point to uh, that myscript.js file. The type attribute is used to indicate what kind of script, because there's actually more types of scripts than just JavaScript. And there's some specifics about it, too. Uh, but typically, application forward slash JavaScript is the default. And in fact, it's so much the default that you don't even need to declare the type. It's just some older developers who've been doing this stuff for a long time will, will put in the type attribute. And it looks something like this, just JavaScript, uh, script type equals application forward slash JavaScript, okay? And that's just declaring that this is in fact a JavaScript type. It's one extra step you don't even need to do in modern browsers, okay? Because most browsers will actually see this script tags like that and already automatically know you're talking about JavaScript. 
okay? But I just want you to be aware of this because if you ever come across an HTML file, you might see it say script type application JavaScript. Okay, so I'm gonna actually demonstrate this a little bit here. Now that I've blown enough hot air. Um, let's do visual studio code. Never show it again. Go away. All right, so I'm going to make a new file here in my Visual Studio code. It's going to be an HTML file. I'm just going to call this index.html. Okay, this is a brand new HTML file. Looks like I might have some questions here. Uh, can I send you a copy of the deck at the end of the course? Yeah, I can. I can. Um, I need to find uh, find out how to get that to you, but if I can, I'll probably put it up on GitHub. So for those of you who don't know, I have a question here. Oh, you guys can actually read it. Can you send us a copy of your deck at the end of the course? Uh, so he's talking about, or she might be, uh, is talking about my PowerPoint presentation. Um, I'm going to see about trying to make that available. Yes. So you want that recording? God, fan. Yeah, that would be great. Yep. Um, so. I'll try to see if I can get that up on GitHub so that you guys can actually see the PowerPoint presentation. Is SRC short for source in terms of where the JavaScript file is located? That is absolutely correct, anonymous attendee. Uh, could the script type also be text forward slash JS? What's the difference between application and JavaScript? And so there really is not much of a difference. What they're talking about is I put up here on this. This application in JavaScript could also be text forward slash JavaScript. That could, oh, I can feel that. Hopefully it gets there. Uh, so application JavaScript might also be text forward slash JavaScript. Just so that you guys are aware, that's kind of the older way to do it is that this would say type equals text forward slash JavaScript instead of application JavaScript. Okay, so I've answered all those questions. Let's go ahead and do, oops. All right, so I'm gonna build my HTML file here. And I would highly recommend that you guys go ahead and if you don't already have Visual Studio Code installed right now, do it now, because I really would like for you guys to follow along with this, okay? I want you guys to be typing along with me because See it, hear it, do it. There are the three ways that you guys can learn how to do this stuff. And just sitting here listening to me talk is great and everything, but I'll tell you what, there's nothing that substitutes actually doing it, even if you're just mimicking what I'm typing. So we got HTML tags to start our HTML document. We've got our head tags, which are going to declare the head of the HTML document, where we can put things like the title of the page. I'm just going to say my page, and then we're going to have the body. Okay. Now, anybody remember where can I put the script tags? Can I put them in the body? Right here. Can I put them, can I put them right there? Can I put them in the head? Yeah, I can put them either way. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to put it in body here first. There, done. <laughs> All right, let's do a little bit more, something a bit more complex than that. Let's do this. I'm going to do a simple little JavaScript function called alert. This is a built-in function in JavaScript. You have a question? Yeah, it's just um, it's going to go to my uh, to the register in the uh, body. Oh, doc type HTML. Yeah, you need that at the top of your document. Okay. Do you need the index? Do you need that index.html? That's the name of the document I'm creating. So it's just a file on my hard disk called index.html that I just created using Visual Studio Code. Uh, this is, if I show you, see, here's my folder. So this is the folder here, 
that I'm doing my demonstration out of, and you can see the index.html file that I just created is right there. Okay? Does that make sense? Does that answer your question at all? No? I, I did a horrible job of answering that, didn't I? Uh, you, you don't, it doesn't need to be indexed. You can call it whatever you want, but it needs to be .html. Does that make sense? I want to make sure everybody's with me here. You just did save as and gave it a set domain, right? You can do that. Uh, one of the great things about Visual Studio Code is that I can just say, oh, right okay. here, I click on a new button there, oh, cool. and I just type in what the name of the file is. So I can do something .html. Okay. Does that answer your question? No? Let me see what you got. Let me make sure you're on. Okay. Um, all right, click on this button right here. Uh, you know, down here, just this one right there. Here we go. And that's going to give you the whole panel. Yeah. Okay, so just so that I can point this out to anybody who else might be lost, to get this little explorer window here, you just click on this button right here that my mouse is hovering over. Okay? So that's how you can get that little explorer, is if you just click on that button right there. That's going to pop out the explorer that tells you, that allows you to edit the different files within a folder structure. Now that actually brings me to something I probably skipped over and I probably should show you guys is I can close out of all this. Let me save what I've got here. Oops. So, so mine has a blue, is that, but it doesn't say that image or it doesn't say image like here. You know, like you have. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have a completely different one. I'm going to show you here. I'm just going to start from scratch, okay? I'm just going to start from scratch because I probably skipped over some things some of you might not have picked up on. So here I am in Visual Studio Code. I've got nothing. I've got absolutely nothing. Just opened it up. I'm going to go to open a folder, okay? Now, from here, you can create a brand new folder, my demo. Select it. And now you just get a blank screen, right, with the welcome. I'm going to close that welcome screen. So we're working here with the Explorer. Okay, so I've got a folder. Visual Studio Code is now looking inside of an empty folder. There's nothing in here. Okay, I just created it. There's nothing. There's no files, no HTML, no JavaScript, nothing. Now, inside of this, I'm going to click on this button right here, which allows me to create a new file. And now I just need to name it. So this is going to be index.html. Now I'm working on my index file. Are we good? Is everybody on the same page with that? Any questions? No? I did perfect. I did awesome. Steve, go yay, Steve. Perfect. OK. I couldn't You can't get it together? Let me make sure. Uh, go to open folder. It looks like you currently have documents. Okay, actually, can't see that real quick. And uh, go up and file. Up, up here, up and file. And close out of the one that you have open on it. Close the folder. Close the folder. Yeah. Okay, so now you completely want. Okay, so now you can go File, and go Open Folder. Now go and create one somewhere on your hard disk. So maybe try to go to your C drive, and just make up a folder, so go to New Folder. I apologize, everyone. I, I want to make sure everybody's on the same on board here, and we're not skipping over anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, perfect. And then select it. Select it again. Okay, now you can go and click on my demo and just create that video. And I just name it index.html. All right. You good? Just, just hit select folder. That's fine if you're in a new folder. Click on that. And hit select folder. Okay. Now you have a blank screen. You have nothing in there. So now go to, now go to, oh, you already have stuff in there, don't you? 
Yeah. You've already got files in there. Okay, sorry, no problem. No, I didn't mean That's okay. Go ahead and close the folder. So go up to file. Go to file. Go to close folder. Close folder. Oh, there you go. Try to open one that is brand new and empty. has nothing in it. No files, no nothing. Okay, so I've got a blank index.html file. I've got nothing in it. I'm going to do doc type HTML. I'm going to make my HTML tags. I have an autocomplete extension on this, so if you guys are wondering how I did all that, this auto close tag is an extension I have installed on Digital Studio Code. It's very helpful. Makes typing a lot faster. Were you able to get an empty folder? Okay, good. Yeah, perfect. Now I'll just go to uh, go to open. If you have not yet opened a folder, just go and click on open folder. Um, just create a new one. Go to the new folder and just create it and say it's uh, like JavaScript demo. Uh, JavaScript. I'm going to go ahead and select the folder. And then select it again. All right, so now you have an empty folder that you're open. Okay, so now I just click on this icon right here. Oops, one more time, I'm sorry, you already have it open. Okay, so now if you move down there, you see that icon right there? Just click on that, and that'll create a new file for you. And just type index.html. Okay. I think we got everybody on the same page here. Yes. Oh, you know what? Begin and the end. How do I get the automatic? Yes, that's yeah. fine. So if you go to, on Visual Studio Code, if you go to, um, oops. if you go to, oh, I forget where it is now, all of a sudden. I'm drawing a blank here. It should be selection. Oh, where is mine? It's, oh, it's under tests, I think. No? Where is it? No, well, the extension. Yeah. Where is it? The icon down there. Yeah, it's down here. If you click on this button, you can do a search. There was a menu option up here, and I can't think of where it is. But if you just do a search for auto close, you can go find the auto close tag, and then you just click on the install. Is everybody good with that? Everybody understand where I'm at with that? I'm getting a lot of blank stares. <laughs> okay. I was hoping to not have to get too much into the extension stuff, but it's important that we do cover this. So this is uh, the auto close tag extension for Visual Studio Code. It just makes typing things simpler. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hmm? I need to install it, but no, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you just click on the install button. Oh. And that'll install the extension for your code editor. Okay? Auto, just type in auto tag right here. Mm -hmm. Just change that to auto close. To auto close. Get rid of all of it. Okay, yeah. And just click on that one right there. And then just install. All right. And all that does, all this auto close tag extension does is just help me out by allowing me to do the head tags and it'll automatically create the close tag for me. It's really handy. Okay. Now I'm going to backtrack here because I'm going to go back to the file that I had open. Folder. Folder. All right, so here's where we're at. Here's my index file. I've got a title tag called my page. 
I've got my script tags, and I'm writing some JavaScript here. I'm using a function called alert. It's a built-in JavaScript function. It comes right out of the box. I don't have to do anything special, okay? And I'm just going to say, I'm open. Very simple, very easy little code here. I'm going to save this. And now you can just double click on it from where the folder is. If you want to open up the folder, you can just double click it like this, and that'll open. And now we can see I'm open. That's the message that I told it to pop up, right? Uh, another way you can open it is um, you can get another extension. And it is open in browser. If you click on, op if you get this extension open in browser, you can actually just open the file directly in the default browser. So this is another very handy extension you can install in Visual Studio Code. So I'll be using that pretty extensively because I can just right click now and open up in my default browser that I'm open. Okay. So that's my alert. I'm open. Any questions so far? Okay, I can put on here type equals application JavaScript. So there's my type. I can save that, relaunch it. Same thing. So there's really not much difference between the two, right? Just one is declaring it explicitly, and the other is just implicitly implied by the browser. The browser just sees script and just knows you're running JavaScript. The last thing that we can do is actually create a separate file for JavaScript. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new folder here. I'm going to call it scripts. Everybody see that? Everybody see how I did that? I can do it again if I need to. I just clicked on this new folder icon right here. I created a folder called scripts. Okay? And now inside of my scripts folder, I'm going to right click on scripts folder and I'm going to say new file. And I'm going to put mypage.js. So I'm building a brand new JavaScript file. This JavaScript file is strictly going to contain my JavaScript. So I'm going to take this code, this alert, I'm open. I'm going to drop it in this JS file like that. OK, so all I've done is just taken the JavaScript code. I've taken it out of the HTML file, and I've put it in this JS file. Everybody good with that so far? Yes? Anybody have any questions so far on what I've done there? Uh, about uh, my page, but mm -hmm. uh, how did you? Uh, run? How did I make that file? Yeah. So I just went to this icon here, uh -huh. which creates a new folder, and I created this folder called scripts. Okay. So I created this folder right here, the scripts folder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now inside of that scripts folder, I just right click on the scripts folder itself and I say new file. Mm -hmm. And then I just call it my page. Okay. And now all I did is I opened up that JS file. I just pasted the code, the alert I'm open, and I stuck it in there. Now, that's not the end of what I have to do, though, because I have to tell my HTML file where to go find this JavaScript, right? I have to tell my HTML file, hey, I have this JS file over here. I want you to use it. So the way that we do that is right here in our script tag, I'm going to do SRC, which is the source attribute. Source, SRC. And we're going to assign it the value of where you can find that JavaScript file. I'm going to start with a dot, which means go to the root. Go, go to where my file, this HTML file. Start there. Forward slash. Scripts. That's the folder 
that my my page JavaScript file is in, right? So object scripts, and now I need to point to the my page .js. Now if I save this, and I need to save my my page .js. So now both of my files are saved, and if I run this. Come on, Microsoft Edge browser. Come on. I'm open. There we go. So we got the JavaScript. I'm going to do that one more time so you guys don't think that's a fluke. I promise. I'm open. So I was able to extract the code out of my HTML file, put it into a JavaScript file all by itself, so I can manage the JavaScript file all by itself. Okay? Yes? Um, so you can just go to uh, where did you save the files again? Where did where did you save the index file? Uh, So you haven't saved this yet. And you need a semicolon. Uh, oh, yeah. Semicolon. Okay. okay. Now save. Now you can. Okay. And now where did you save this file? Oh, yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Oh, it's exclamation with exclamation point dot type. Here, I'll show the code. I'll put the scope. I'm going to put the code back up here so everybody can see it. I see we've got some raised hands here. So, doc type HTML. Let me check out what we've got for questions here. Uh, with placing the JavaScript tag in the head tag, run the JavaScript code immediately once the web page loads as opposed to when it's placed in the body tag. Mises, yes, that is correct. If you put the JavaScript uh, tag, the script tag, in the head, it will load at the beginning of the HTML page. If you put it in the body, it'll wait till the body is rendered. So it can add a little bit of a delay. Is it okay to use Adobe Dreamweaver CC instead? Sure. Oh, never mind. <laughs> uh, using the run browser extension, is it possible to change the default browser from IE to Chrome? It's just going off of the default of whatever you have set up for the HTML extension. Just opens up the default. If you right click, if you right click, you'll see that I can also open in another, another browser and I can select Google Chrome. So it's a handy little extension to have. 
All right, let's see, where are we at here? I think I have more, I have a chat here. Oh, geez, so. All right. Thank you. So, okay. I have a question. Sure. On, on the line four. Okay. On line four? Uh huh. Okay. We have the title. This is the title of the page. Is everybody able to feel the, the fan? Is it finally kind of cooling down a little bit in here? Very, very slightly. Very slightly. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. We're just new into this building. We just. Okay. All right. Good. I thought about sticking it next to the door because I thought that might help a little bit, but and if we have to move it, we will. Okay. Are we good so far? We've seen the source attribute. We've seen the type attribute. We've typed some code. We've written some script tags. We've actually done some JavaScript coding. Very simple, very basic, but we've done some. Let's see what we've got next here. Comments. Comments are a very common thing that you will find in JavaScript. You can use a double forward slash, so forward slash, forward slash, to comment out one line of code, which basically means the browser will not do anything with that line. It just interprets it. Don't worry about it. Ignore this. Okay? If you need to comment out multiple lines, then you're going to want to use this forward slash, asterisk, asterisk, forward slash. Okay, so for example, here we have our scripts tags, our beginning and closing scripts tags. And we're going to say forward slash, forward slash, this line is commented out. Okay, it just comments out that line. The browser will see that and do nothing with it. It'll just leave it there. The other thing we can do is the forward slash asterisk and then the asterisk forward slash, and you'll see that this line and the following lines are all commented out by just doing that. So you can comment out multiple lines with just the forward slash asterisk and then asterisk forward slash. Yes? And what types of things are you going to comment out? Good question. So what kind of things will you comment out? You can comment things like, I don't know what this function is supposed to do. <laughs> okay? Or what's really, really common is, if you're trying to debug, if you're trying to figure out what's wrong with a page, sometimes you will want to comment out one particular section of that code so that it skips over it. But you don't want to delete it. You just kind of want to skip over it. So often you will comment out that one or two or however many lines just to kind of see what the browser will do if you take that part of the code out. Well, that fix my problem. Sometimes also you will have an old line of code that has some information that's relevant to help you make the new version of whatever it is. So if somebody wrote something before, it's not working quite right, and you want to revise it, you want to kind of make it work better, you'll often comment out their old code and put in your new code so that if your new code doesn't work, you can easily switch back. You just have to uncomment it. Okay? This is not a very typical thing that you will find developers happy with you doing. Okay? If you comment out code and leave it, it kind of bloats the size of the file. So it makes it take longer to download. And it also looks kind of tacky and people aren't really quite sure what you're doing. But it is a very common thing you will find out there, is that people will just comment out old lines of code. Okay? Because they don't, they're, they're afraid to let it just be deleted. Okay. Pop quiz time. Fill in the blanks. Script, who wants to try to give this a go? Type. Type? Mm -hmm. So that's type. The script type is application forward slash JavaScript. What's this one? Uh, so it's a source. Source, which is? It's an SRC. SRC, very good. How about this last blank line here? Yeah. Script, no. very, very good, very good. Perfect, OK. Next up, what part of the document can we place script tags? Anybody want to give that a go? 
What part of the document can we place for text? Head and body. Head and body. There you go. Incoming. Very nice. <laughs> All right. What characters do we use to comment out multiple lines? Uh, multiple lines. Forward slash, asterisk, and then at the end you put asterisk, asterisk forward slash. slash. Cool. All right. Good deal. I think we all kind of knew that. We were just wait for good old Steve to tell us the right answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can do just uh, new comments on that. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I have seen people, they don't want to do the forward slash yeah. asterisk, so they just do forward slash, forward slash, forward slash, forward slash, forward slash, forward slash. I've seen that all, the, all over the place. <laughs> okay, variables. We're starting to get into some of the real technical stuff now. So, variables. Variables are named containers for storing data values. Okay? So you actually name a container. You have a container that you're going to store some data into. Okay? And these are called variables. Now the value can be changed over time. So you can change the value that's stored in this variable. You can change it. This time it's three, this time it's six, this time it's nine, this time it's Steve, so this time it's my car, it's a Prius. It's, you can change the value of a variable to whatever you want it to be. And it can change over time. You use the var keyword to declare a variable. So we're going to say var x. Var x with a little semicolon at the end. Okay? That's how you declare a variable. Just use the var keyword. And then you give it a name. In this case, the name of the variable is x. Now, you use the assignment operator. It's not the equal sign. You use the assignment operator to assign a value to the variable. And even I fall into this habit of saying x equals 3. It's not really x equals 3. It's x is assigned the value of 3. Or we are assigning the value of 3 to x. Yes? You don't have to declare what the variable is. OK, so in case you guys didn't hear his question, do we need to declare what kind of value it is? Like, is it an integer? Is it a decimal? Is this a string? The answer is no. JavaScript is dynamically typed. It is not statically typed. The browser will figure it out for you, which is one of the great things about JavaScript. And it's also one of the Achilles heel of JavaScript. Okay? It's a really nice thing, but there's some drawbacks to it. Okay, so we're assigning the value of 3 to x. X is not equal to 3. I know that's a little confusing sometimes. Even I say, like I said, X equals 3. I do it all the time, but it's wrong. You can assign a value at the time of declaration. So you can kind of take these two things, var X and X is assigned the value of 3, and you can combine them into one line of var X is assigned the value of 3. You can find that all into one line. So these two lines of code up here, are actually compressed into just one. That's a very, very common way to do things. Okay? Mm -hmm. Functions can also be assigned to variables. We'll talk about functions here shortly. But one of the really tremendously wonderful things about JavaScript is that functions can actually be assigned to variables. It's a weird concept. It's, it's one of the reasons we call JavaScript a functional language. Because functions are what we call a First class citizen. They are utmost importance in JavaScript. We focus, it's so heavily oriented towards functions are the thing that operates JavaScript. Okay? So functions can be assigned to variables. That's kind of one of the reasons why it's called a functional language. Let's go ahead and dig into some code here and let's create a variable. I'm going to drop my JavaScript page because I want to just kind of put it all in my HTML for you guys to see. So I'm just going to drop that my page. I'm just not going to reference it anymore. The JS file still exists. I'm just not pointing to it anymore, which is perfectly acceptable. My browser will just not care. It will ignore it. It won't load the JS file because I'm not telling the HTML file to load it. But I can do var x 
and I could say x is assigned the value of 3. Now, if I run this, what do you suppose is going to happen? Nothing. I haven't really done anything with this, so let's go ahead and do something with it. Let's do alert x. Anybody want to take a stab at what this is going to do? Okay, let's take a look. I'm going to just open in default browser and three. There we go. Huzzah! We use the variable. And if we want to shorten this up at all, because we're just really, really lazy developers, we can assign the value of five to it. And I'm just going to comment this out so we don't say it's three anymore. And now I'm just going to go ahead and run this again. And we have five. Because I assigned the value of five when I declared the variable. Is everybody good with that? Yeah. Simple enough? Okay. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to throw you guys a curveball. What's that going to do? Anybody want to take a guess what's going to happen if I run this page now? Three. Is it going to show three or five? Three. Three? Let's see what we get. Three. Three. Congratulations, everybody. Very good. Very, very good. See? This stuff is easy. Right? It's easy. Piece of cake. Okay. So we've declared a variable. We've used the variable. Let's move on. Dun, dun, dun. Functions. Functions. Yay. A JavaScript function is a block of code designed to perform a particular task. So we're going to take these lines of code from here to here. We're going to stick all those lines of code into something called a function. And then we're going to name that block of code. That way it's easy for us to reference. And we expect that at the end of all this code running, it's going to do something. Okay? It's going to perform some particular task. Now, a JavaScript function is executed when something invokes it. We also reference this. We also say that it calls it. So a function can be called or invoked. You'll hear those terms used uh, interchangeably. Okay? So function, this is how you create a function in JavaScript. You write out function name. So function is a keyword in JavaScript. That means that what I am declaring right now is a function. The name is what you're going to name that function. Then we have an open parenthesis and a closed parenthesis, and we have these things called parameters which we'll talk about parameters a little bit in just a moment. But notice that we have, after the open and closed parentheses, we have this open and closed curly brace. And everything between those two curly braces is code that's going to be executed. Okay? That's the code that's actually going to be executed when you call that function. So parameters are optional. You do not have to have parameters. What they are is essentially a variable. A parameter is essentially a variable that is available within my function. Okay, So you can think of parameter 1 and parameter 2 are basically variables that are declared inside of my function. And we'll see how that kind of all ties together in just a moment. I'm going to go ahead and create a function. I'm going to say function pop up message. Okay? There's my open and closed curly braces. So, so far we're declaring a function called pop up message. I've got the open and closed parentheses, then open and closed curly braces. And everything inside of my curly braces is the code I want to run when I call this function. And I'm going to move 
alert X down into this. So that alert function call that I'm calling the alert function that's already built into access, or I said access tonight, built into JavaScript. Sorry, my access. Uh, alert X is now in my function for the pop-up message. Now what I'm going to do is I need to call that function. And the way you do that is from right here on my side of my script, I'm going to say pop up message. And I've put the open and close curly brace, or I'm sorry, open and close parentheses there. So I'm using pop up message, which is the name of my function. And I'm using the open and close parentheses to actually call my function. So when you see these parentheses, this means you're either calling a function or you're defining a function. The way you can tell is whether you've got the function keyword in front of it. So you're either calling the function or you're creating the function or declaring the function. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? Any questions about that? Yes? Call the function before you declare it? Yes, you can. Yes, you can. As long as it's defined within what we call the scope, okay? which everything between this script tag and this script tag is in one scope. Scope is kind of a complex topic I wasn't planning on getting into just yet. Just understand that as long as, um, as, long as this uh, function call is calling a function that's kind of at the same level in the same script tags, it should be access accessible. I'm going to go ahead and save this. And I'm just going to go ahead and run it. And we should just basically get the site says three. Now, what about parameters? Remember, I said there were those optional parameters. Value to display. I'm going to make a parameter. The parameter name is called value to display. So here's my declaration of my function, right? I'm declaring my function. It's called pop-up message. And I have inside that a parameter called value to display. Now, since I've done that, I now essentially have a variable in my function. So you can think of this as, I, as if I had just done this. That's essentially what I've done. Okay, but it's special. It's special in a very particular way. Because I've got this variable now that is actually going to be assigned some sort of value when I call it. So what I've done here. For those of you who didn't see that, I did it pretty quick. I have my parameter here called value to display. And now I'm going to actually pass in whatever that variable is, whatever the, the variable, the parameter is for this value to display is now going to be alerted. And up here, I said pop-up message. When I call the pop-up message function, I'm going to pass in X. I'm passing in x to my function. Now, whatever the value of x is will actually be assigned to this value to display parameter. And now it will display whatever is in value to display. OK? So I'm going to take out this x equals 3 here. So now our code says var x. So we'll just step through this here real quick. Declaring a variable called x. We're going to call the pop-up message function and pass in the value of x, which is 5. We're calling this function called pop-up message, and it has a parameter on it called value to display. The value of x will be assigned to this value to display. And then the alert pop-up will then display the value that was passed in as a parameter. Okay? Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. All right, good, because this is crucial. This is... This is programming that, like the heart of programming, is being able to pass in parameters. Yes. I have parameters uh, for optional. How did the code work without? Ah, 
So before I just declared X up here, and then I just called X from within here. You said I didn't have to send it anything because of that scope thing that I was talking about. I was going to say, yeah, it doesn't pop up message. The variable is out of the scope of pop up like message, right? Yes, but it's hierarchical. So if you go up one level, everything inside of this function can see what's up above it. Okay. Yeah, you're kind of getting into the weeds there a little bit there, which is okay. I'd be happy to talk about <laughs> scope maybe a little offline. For this. Uh, but essentially, yes. You, as long as so, what we're talking about here is that this variable x is declared outside of the declaration of this function. How is it then before this, before this code that I wrote here, how did the alert know to what the value of x was since it was written inside of here? And the answer is scope. Okay, the answer is scope. The, the scope is for this entire, this is what we call the global scope. So everything inside of this is available globally on the page, which is really dangerous. It's really, really dangerous. Uh, but I'm doing this for demonstration purposes. If you guys want to learn more about the scope and how to, I mean, we, we teach this stuff about how to get into the nitty gritty, how to avoid problems with writing your JavaScript. Um, but really, this is just about kind of demonstrating that you can create a function, you can pass in a, uh, what we call an argument to the parameter, and then use that value of that parameter in the code of your function. Okay. Everybody good with that? Any questions about that? Okay. Let's save this, and let's just go ahead and run this. Oops, that's not where we run it. So it should say five, and it does. Okay. I'm just going to check real quick. It looks like I might have some more questions. I, when doing a peer-to-peer -peer code review, is it best practice to, to practice to comment a section of code to describe what it does? Uh, yes and no. There's a philosophy here. So the question that the meniscus is asking is, when you're doing peer-to-peer -peer code review, is it good practice to comment a certain section so that you can describe what that code is doing? The answer is yes and no. It depends on who you're working with. I personally do not write very many comments to tell what my code is doing. And the reason is kind of twofold. Number one, if I write a comment and then I change the code, so I write a comment, I write my code, then three months later I come back and change my code. How likely is it that I'm going to remember to also change my comment? Whoops, now my comment says it does something that it doesn't do. Now I've confused everybody who reads my code. The second thing is that really your code should be bite-sized. It should be very, very small. And this goes into a whole coding practice called clean code, which we get into when we're doing some of the more course level stuff when we're talking about the 12-week program. Uh, where we talk about how to do more clean code style of programming so that you can write code that's easily readable and more more uh, smaller and not big giant functions and stuff. Um, but basically, I would say it's entirely up to whoever you are and working who you're working with to answer that question. Uh, does not goes type there. Yeah, okay, I got that. Jennifer forward slash asterisk asterisk forward slash. Very good, Jennifer. Very good. <laughs> All right. Okay, uh, I'm supposed to answer all these, I guess, live. I forgot to click on the buttons. Okay. So we've declared and called functions. We've used parameters. We've invoked a function, but we've kind of done it in one particular way. There's actually three different ways you can invoke a function. You can invoke a function when an event occurs, such as when a user clicks a button. Okay? That's an event. It's your browser will actually raise what we call an event. It'll say, hey, the user clicked the button. Hey, the user moved their mouse over this section of the page. Okay? And you can kind of hook into that. You can say, oh, okay, well, when the user clicks a button, I want this JavaScript to run. Okay? That is done through attributes on HTML tags, which we'll actually do a demonstration of that here shortly. But the short gist of it is you can say, Let's create an HTML button. We have a button object here. And we're saying on click, which is an attribute, right? It's an event attribute. 
on this, this button tag. And you can say, when the on click event is clicked, I want you to call the name of the, whatever the name of the function is that you created in your JavaScript. So name of the function, and notice the open and close parentheses. So that's one way you can call one of these functions, is when somebody clicks on a button, the on click event will call the name, whatever the name of the function is. Another way to do it is what we did, what we just did there, when it is called from some other JavaScript code. So our code actually called a function, right? The third way is something called an if. This is kind of deep in the weeds stuff. You don't really have to worry about it too much right now, but you might see it out in the wild. It's an if. It's called an immediately invoked function expression, which just basically means when the browser renders that section, it will run it. So you can create a function that will run as soon as it's rendered, okay? It's called an if. So it doesn't get called, it's actually just run as soon as it's discovered. So pop quiz time. Complete this variable declaration. Who wants to take a stab at this? Uh, Var? Yes. Cool. It's what? Equal. Assignment operator. Assignment operator. I do it all the time. I swear, I do it all the time. I, I'd say bar, I would do bar speed equals 50. But no, no, it's bar speed is assigned the value of 60. The assignment operator. Okay, I know. It, trust me, it's a distinction that actually will mean something a little bit later here, okay? Fill in the blanks. You know what? I'm just doing it. You want that? There you go. There you go. You did good. I, I do that mistake all the time. Fill in the blank string a function that alerts with a string, with, with a string passed as a parameter. So what do you suppose we would put there? What's in that blank spot right there? Function. 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 Perfect. Okay, what are we going to put in that one right there? Name to alert. Very good, Pat. Name to variable. Very good. I got some smart people here. So what are the three ways a function can be invoked? Um, automatically. Uh, followed by another JavaScript. Okay. And uh, 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 followed by an event, like on bottom. Correct. You can call it with an event from the HTML. You can uh, you can have it called by some other JavaScript code, yeah. or you can use what's called an ify. And anybody remember what ify was? Maybe both function what? Expression. Expression. Yes. All right. Want a water bottle? You did good on that one. You did really good on that one. Yeah. There you go. Okay. Good, good, good. I'm going to take a break. I think everybody probably needs a little break. We good with that? Okay, we'll call it probably about 10 minutes. So everybody can grab some pizza, grab some soda. We'll be back here shortly. I'm going to put a little timer up on here. So let's go ahead and get working on our first application. Scripts document dot write hello world. Okay, so we have document dot write hello world. Some of this probably shouldn't be too far off of what you guys already know how to do, right? This looks kind of familiar. It's not too far off. Let's just kind of break this down a little bit and see what exactly is going on here with this. So we have our script tags. We already know about the script tags. The document is an object. Okay? So we're starting with an object. On that object, we have a function called write. We're passing in between those parentheses. Anybody want to take a guess what that hello world is? What would we call that? String. Huh? String. It's a string. That is correct. It is a string. But parameter. parameter. It's actually called an argument. Oh, okay. okay. I get those two. It's so easy to get those two confused. I know parameter argument. They're really two sides of the same coin. One is what you're sending it. One is what you're taking. So the parameter is what you're defining in the function. The argument is what you're passing into the parameter. Okay, that's just kind of one is calling it, one is the actual declaration or definition of it. 
And then finally, we have this thing called a statement terminator. It is the semicolon, and you've seen me put this semicolon through code. What it really means is, if you think of it in terms of like English, if you're writing a sentence, what's the last thing you put at the end of the sentence? A period. Here's my sentence, done. Here's my sentence, done. That's one line of code. That's one sentence, if you will. See how this is kind of human readable? I have an object called the document. I'm going to write something to it. Here's what I'm writing, done. That's the importance of modern day coding. That is why you can do code without having to be a mathematician. Because all the magic works behind the scenes. The browsers figure all the mathematics out for you. Okay? So let's talk a little bit about objects. Objects are a data type that contain the characteristics and actions of something. A data type that contains the characteristics and actions of something. So, objects have two types of members. We call them members. One is called a property, and one is called a method. And the method is really nothing more than a function. Okay, now, some of you guys might be completely lost on that, so let's, let's kind of do some equating. Let's do some uh, visualization of how this might work. I have a car. Car is an object. In English terms, that's a noun. It's person, place, or thing. It's an object. Person, place, or thing. It's a car. I have a property. The color of the car is red. The property. It's an adjective. It's a descriptive term of what that thing is. Right? It's a description. It's an adjective. A method is really a verb. What can that object do? It can stop. It can accelerate. It can go. It can break. If it's chitty chitty bang bang, it can fly. Right? So what it can do is the method, the verb, what it does. So that's how you can easily think of this. An object is the noun, the property is an adjective, and the method is a verb. The car is red and it stops. Simple enough? Everybody on the same page with that? No. Objects can be declared explicitly by using the new object. New object in quotation marks just means that's like the key word that you would use, not that you need to have it in, in quotation marks, okay? So for example, var my new object equals, no, assign, new object. So there's my new object, open, close, parenthesis, with the statement terminator, okay? So I'm declaring here my new object and I'm assigning the value of a brand new object. Now, objects can also be declared using open and closed curly braces and assigned to a variable. So that looks something like this. Var my other object is assigned the value of just open and closed curly braces. That is essentially the same thing as that. We got some rocking going on here. So that is essentially the same as that. But typically you're going to be see it, you're going to see it done more like this. Var my auto is assigned this object here where the color property is red and the speed property is 60. So these are property declarations inside of where I'm creating my object. So I'm creating a variable, my auto. I'm assigning it this new object. It has two properties, a color and speed. The value of the color is red. The value of speed is 60. Let's go ahead and create an object in code. So let's comment all this out. I'm going to do that by doing forward slash asterisk, asterisk forward slash, done. 
Okay. So I'm going to declare my auto. And I'm going to, I can do new object. Now, this doesn't have any properties on it. We'll get into that a little bit later. But so if I wanted to have some properties on this auto, maybe this isn't exactly the syntax I want to use. Let me do something like this. Color is red. Speed is 60. Okay, so my auto, I'm creating a my auto object. The color of that object is red, the speed is 60. Now I can take this object called my auto and I can access these color and speed properties. So I can do alert my auto dot color. Anybody want to take a stab at what that will do? Display red, huh? Let's take a look. Red. Okay, very good. Quick question, does capitalization matter? Yes, yes it does. Okay. So color has to be capital. Good. I was good. I was I was intentionally leaving this out to see if anybody caught this. So I've used the capital C for color because I declared it as capital C here. If I did this as lowercase and then I tried to call it with uppercase here, it wouldn't work. It's it's uh, capitalization matters. But if they're matching, it's okay to have it lowercase. Yes. Okay. It's okay to have it lowercase, it's okay to have it capitalized. Okay, and when I call my auto, notice that I do my auto with ca lowercase m, capital A. What's, what do you suppose would do, what happened if I did that? It didn't even work. I have to open up tools. And here I can actually see There's an error. My auto is undefined. Yes, yes. Go away. Can I stop you? My auto is undefined. So here on index HTML line 12, uh, character 9, line 12, character 9, I'm trying to do my auto, and that's not declared because it's actually my auto with a lowercase m. OK. Everybody good so far? Yes. All right. Good, good, good. All right. Let me go back to the slideshow. Properties. Properties are variables declared on an object. Properties do not need to be declared using the var keyword. And you can do something like this. Var automobile. So we declared an automobile using the new object. And then we said we can actually say here, Automobile stop speed equals 90, and that should actually be a capital S. So it's declared using what's called a dot notation. Okay, so we're saying the speed property, even though up here I haven't actually declared the properties on this object here, I just declared that there's some sort of object. Now I'm adding to that object a property called speed, and I'm assigning it the value of 90. So it's just like declaring a variable, but I'm just saying it's this property on this object. I could also do it this way, automobile color using open and close straight brackets like that, color in quotation marks is red. And it's declared using what we call an index. Both of these are legitimate ways of adding or even calling a property on an object. <coughs> So now we can say, that essentially the same thing is written here. 
New automobile equals speed 90, or I said equals. Haha. <laughs> new automobile is assigned the value of this new object of speed 90 color red. So this here, these three lines are essentially the same as this one line, just with a different variable name, right? This one we call it automobile, this one we're calling new automobile. But these two objects are essentially the same. It's just you're declaring them later. You're declaring those properties after you've created the object. Yes? Especially about declaring using an index. We, we use the uh, quotation mark for the index, but use single quotations for the They're interchangeable. The They're interchangeable. You can do single quotation marks or double quotation marks for either case. Mm -hmm. oh. Can you, uh, when you do the index, uh, let's say you, uh, you index another something speed. Mm -hmm. um, the index variable, can you call them by index variable? Let's say other rule zero to show color. Would, would that work? No. Because it's, uh, That's to do with arrays. Okay. Arrays are very similar, but they're not the same. They're very similar in the way that they look syntactically, but they're a little different. Um, and in fact, if you tried to do something like this, on an array, it would convert the array into an object. The browser automatically does an array itself. The array turns into an object. Okay. So basically, these two things are the same. It's just that they're being created differently. One, you're using three different lines to create it. One, you can do it just as one single line. And there might be instances where this makes sense to do either way. Maybe you don't really want to add the property until you know something is true or not. I don't necessarily want to add the speed until I know that it's moving. Okay, so really, let's just do this. I'm going to rewrite this. So instead of are my auto new object and I'm going to say my auto dot color equals blue. Notice I'm using the single quotation there. You can do single or double quotation marks. They both indicate a string. So now if we run this, blue. So I did this a little differently, didn't I? If we just inspect this code a little bit, the first way I declared it was using this syntax here of defining the properties on my object while I'm assigning it to a variable. This way here, though, I'm just creating a blank object. And now down here, I'm saying my auto.color is blue. Now here's something. Let's go back to this. I declared my auto. I set the color to red. But down here, I'm assigning to the color blue. What do you think is going to pop up when I run this? Blue. Okay. Stop popping up. I'm good enough for that. Right. Okay. The other way we can do this is to say color. And that essentially does the same thing. My auto color is blue. If we run this, blue. Everybody good so far? Any questions so far? Man, I am on a roll. Oh, wait. Oh, this thing. No. Yes. No questions. I'm awesome. Okay. <laughs> Are you holding off some later? Oh, okay. All right. Methods. Methods. Methods are just like properties, but the data type is an anonymous function. Anonymous function? Anonymous function. 
Hmm. Bar automobile is assigned an object where speed is five and accelerate is function. Wait a minute. What's missing there? What's missing there? Function. What did we do last time when we declared a function, when we created a function? We had to give it a name. Here, there's no name. In fact, what's happening is the name is accelerate. This is what we call an anonymous function. There's no name for it. It's just a function. And we're assigning the function to a variable. Remember how I was telling you that at the very, very early beginning, like last hour, how I was saying that functions are first class citizen. Functions can be assigned to variables. Functions can be assigned to properties, which are nothing more than variables on an object. So here we're creating this function. It's anonymous. There's no name to it. What is this? This object. This object is called automobile. No, no, this dot C. Yeah. Oh, this. Oh, very good. Very good. Okay. Good. Somebody picked up on that. That's awesome. Okay. This is a reference to this object. Automobile. It's a way of saying. This thing that I'm working inside of, I'm referencing that. Okay? So I'm working inside of automobile, right? There's a property in here called speed. My accelerate method is going to take the speed property of this object and increase it by five. Everybody got that? Any questions on that? So no name is needed because it's an anonymous function. And this refers to the current object, which is automobile. So find the speed property on this automobile and add five to it. Okay, so let's do that. Let's write that code. All right, let's go. My auto dot accelerate equals function this dot speed plus equals five. Now in my alert here, I'm going to change from asking what the color is to asking what the speed is. What do you suppose is going to happen? What do you suppose this is going to display? You know what? I'm going to get rid of a lot of this extra stuff here. I'm going to get rid of these comments because they're dirty, dirty, dirty comments. It's not clean code. Anybody want to take a stab at what they think this is going to display? Should we display 65? Yeah. Everybody in agreement, 65? Hmm. Didn't call accelerate. I didn't call accelerate. Bingo. So to do that, let's call accelerate. Before I alert, I'm going to do my auto. Dot accelerate. Now let's see what happens. 55. Let's let's make this a bit more useful though. I think that's a little static. That's kind of accelerate five. I want to be able to pass in value or speed. To increase. I'm going to add the speed to increase. So whatever the value is that I pass into this accelerate method, 
I want to accelerate by that amount. So now if I pass in seven, my code is much more dynamic, isn't it? So I can accelerate once there. Oops. Anybody want to do some math to figure out what my speed is going to be now? Ninety-nine. Ninety-nine. There we go. So I can accelerate. I can continue to call that accelerate function, that accelerate method, and I can pass in a value that I want to increase the speed by. I think that's pretty cool. It's much more dynamic, right? I don't have a static value of five that is always incremented by. I can pass in this parameter of how much I want to accelerate it by. All right. Next up, pop quiz. What are the two types of members on an object? Go. There you go. <laughs> Cut for you. We don't have any more verbal uh, I do. I do. I'll have to say that one for a little later. True or false? Objects can be created using by using new object. No. Objects can only be created by using the object. That is false. There are other ways to create an object. What is an anonymous function? No name. No name. So we don't need it. No We're assigning a function to a property, essentially. It's called a method. All right. Let's dig into some arithmetic operators. We can add 2 plus 3 equals 4. We can subtract. 4 minus 3 equals 1. We can multiply. 5 times 3 is 15. We can divide. 6 divided by 2 equals 3. And modulus. Oh, my God. Modulus. 25 modulus 4 equals 1. Anybody want to take a stab at what modulus means? Anybody know what modulus means? Remainder. Remainder. That's exactly it. It doesn't mean the remainder. If I divide 25 by 4, I have a remainder of 1. This is very helpful for knowing, we'll get into loops a little bit later, but it's like, check to see if the value is divisible by 3. Check to see if the value is divisible by 2. Check to see if the value is divisible by 16. Okay. That's how you can tell certain calculations using modulus. Okay. If 25 modulus 5 equals zero, then I know that it's divisible by five. So every fifth time, do this thing. Okay, We'll get into loops and stuff a little bit later, but understanding the arithmetic operators is pretty important. Now, two plus two equals four is going to cause some problems. We'll see why in just a little bit here. Let's talk comparison operators. Comparison operators evaluate evaluate Evaluate. Evaluate. Is it true or false? Don't evaluate. Evaluate. Oh, wait. Anyway, they evaluate to true or false. That's what a comparison operator is. And we should probably be familiar with some of these. But JavaScript, remember how I was saying equals? It's not equals. It's the assignment operator. That's because that's equal. Mm -hmm. That is equal. Okay? Right there. Is 6 equal to 6? That is true. Is 6 equal to 7? That is false. So the equal sign will tell you that something is either true or false. And that is the crux of all logic in programming. Does this thing evaluate to true or false? That's really ultimately what it all boils down to. Is this thing true or false? JavaScript has this thing called identical, which is basically the same thing as equal, but a little bit different. Five identical to five is true. Five identical to quotation mark five 
If I did five equals uh, quotation marks five, that would e that would equal true up here. If I use this equal sign, it would be true. Okay, this five equals equals five with five in quotation marks. If I use just the equal sign up here, that would actually uh, evaluate to true. But because I'm using this identical operator, it's checking to also see is five identical to the string five, which evaluates to false. Okay. There's something called the not equal operator, which six is not equal to seven is true. <laughs> I love it when we start thinking about this way. Six is not equal to seven. That's true. So that actually returns true. Six is not equal to six is false. Not a sign. It's basically just taking this equals and flipping it around, right? I want to see if something is or is not equal, but I want to know the opposite of it. Uh, it's kind of goofy, but. This is actually quite important, it turns out. Being able to use not equal is very, very important. And not identical is essentially the same thing as I, well, like what we did with a period equal and not equal, identical and not identical. It's basically the same thing. So uh, string value of five is not equal to the numerical value of five, that is true. The string of six is not equal to six is false. They are identical. They're not not identical. <laughs> All right, I love that tree. I mean, think about that logically. Wait a minute. I want to see if something is not equal or not identical so that it returns true for me so that I can do my logic. Okay. Greater than, or as I like to say, cookie monster. The cookie monster always faces the larger number, right? That would evaluate to true. The cookie monster likes eight cookies more than he likes six cookies. The cookie monster would say that this is false. Three cookies is not so it will be. Okay. So three cookies is less than seven cookies. Therefore, the greater than would return to false. Anybody else, when they were learning this in kindergarten or whatever, was it second or third grade, whatever it was, did you hear the cookie monster? The cookie monster always eats the bigger number? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, something like that? All right. So greater than or equal to. So you can actually check to see if something is oops, greater than or equal to. So five is greater than or equal to five is actually true. But two is greater than or equal to five is false. And then we have the opposite. Less than 6 is less than 7, that would equal true, but 12 is not less than 6, so that would return false. And then less than or equal to, we have 5. And look at this. Look at what that is. 5 in quotation marks is less than or equal to 5 is actually true. So that means um, 5 in quotation marks would be equal to 5 during the 2 equal times the first one. Not identical, but equal. Correct. Yeah. And then the same thing here with 8 is less than or equal to 4, but that's false because 8 is less than 4. I'm sorry, it's greater than 4. It's not less than 4. Boy, my goodness. Okay. So let's do a little bit of code here. I just kind of want to do some quick little stuff here. I'm going to delete all this. Bye-bye. All that hard code that I slaved over. God. I'm going to say variable x equals 8, variable y equals 12. Let's do some of these operators here. So alert uh, is x equal to y. Anybody want to take a stab at that? X, is x equal to y? What's that going to return? False? False. Very good. All right. Let's do var z equals rotation marks eight. You said equals. I Sorry. did. I did. Way to go. <laughs> Get on top of that, man. Oh. 
What happened here? What happened here? Uppercase. Oh, I uppercase. I uppercased it. Very good. All right. It's true. That probably seems a little odd, doesn't it? But that's because JavaScript is dynamically typed. It can convert, it can figure out, oh, this is this string of eight, you actually really mean convert to value of eight, numerical digit of eight. And then we'll compare the two. It's able to do that. Okay? But if you really, really want to know, is this thing really, really equal to Z? Is it identical? Let's just switch it up here. I'm going to do not identical to Z. What's this going to return? Is 8 not identical to the string 8? That is true. It is not identical to the string. All right. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Moving along. Logical operators. And and ampersand ampersand returns true. Both operands are true. This is going to take some actual code, I think, to understand what's going on here. So if six equals six and nine equals nine, then this whole expression is true. But six is not equal to seven, even though nine is equal to seven, both sides of this expression need to be true in order for this to return true. So since 6 is not equal to 7, that will return false, and this ampersand ampersand will only return true if both operands are true. So because one of these is false, it will return false. Yes? Turn on the lights? I'm, okay, I can do that. I'm afraid it's going to make things too bright on the screen, but let's try it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm glad. Yeah, well, okay. Where's the shot? Where's the shot? Let me just adjust this a little bit. It's kind of wonky there. All right. Returns true. So pipe, pipe. These are called pipes. Pipe, pipe. Returns true if at least one of the operands is true. So 6 equals 6 or 9 equals 12 will return true. Because even though 9 is not equal to true, at least 6 equals 6 is true. Got a little shaking here. I hope everybody can see. It's okay, man. I'm sorry to, to put you there. If you want to move up here, you can, man. Mm -hmm. Oh, is it? Shame on you. All right. Uh, seven equals one or four equals two. Both of those operands are false. Therefore, we return false. Okay? So, before we get to the quiz, let's actually do that. Let's use some logical operators. So... Anybody want to take a stab at what that's going to do? This first one, x is not equal to z. That is true. That is true. Or False. True. One. They're both true. Eight. So what's this going to return? True. What well, if we do this? Yeah, so both sides of the equation were true. Both sides of this four operand are were true. Now what about it? Oh. 
One is true. One is true. First one is true. This first one is true. Yes. The second one is false. false. But we're using the or operand. Thank Therefore, you. only one of them has to be right. So this will return. I swear it will. True. Better close down all those tabs. Okay. And then finally, we have the and. The ampersand ampersand. So the and operand will return oh. false. And the reason, of course, that it returns false is because both sides of this operand need to be true in order for this expression to return as true. We good? Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. This is the es essence of the logical construct of what we do in programming in general. I don't even know of a language, I don't know of any language that doesn't have some sort of logic like this. This is the crux of all programming languages. Is something true or something false? And I need to be able to have multiple expressions that I'm evaluating to determine whether or not this is true or false. Okay? If you can get this, everything else is just syntactic truth. Okay? It's just real fancy stuff. All right. Let's move along here to the pop quiz, because I know everybody's so excited about my pop quizzes. What is the difference between equals and identical? Rubber ducky time. <laughs> difference between equals and identical. Another equal sign. Another equal sign? Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 Same. Data type. Same. Same what? Data type. Data type. Data type. You, get a, you already have a rubber ducky, I, don't I you? Got you got that one already. Okay. Yeah. Now. <laughs> she didn't want the rubber ducky anyway. I can tell. No, I, need I need a bottle. You need a bottle? There you yeah. go. Here's a bottle. There you go. Thank you. All right. No problem. All right. <laughs> Who was it that wanted the rubber duck earlier? Yeah. There you go, man. There you go. <laughs> oh. Oh, man. I'm you did not take up baseball as a kid, did you? No. no. I that's why I'm coping. Yeah. That's why we're here. I swear we weren't good at sports. All right. Uh, okay. So that's the difference between equals and identical. What do each of these expressions return? First one? False. True. True. Because though this returns false, the OR operator means we can check that and that equals true. Therefore, one of the two sides is true. How about this one? So then not equal to 8 and 9 is less than or equal to 12? True. True. How about 7 plus 3? Is it not equal to 10? False. 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 All right. Good deal. What does the percent symbol return? Remainder. 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 All right, good deal. Concatenation combines two strings together using the plus symbol. So, for example, this is plus one complete sentence. Returns, this is one complete sentence. Now, here's the trick. You have to use the parse int or parse float functions. These are built into JavaScript to convert strings to numbers and avoid concatenation. What do I mean by that? I want to show you this particular problem. What will that return? Eight, 
even though we are using a number here of eight, the default for the plus symbol is actually concatenate. Mm -hmm. Unless it knows all of the parts of it are declared as numbers. Okay, even if I took eight here, this Z, let's see what happens if we just do this. What's this going to do? It knows that both sides are numbers. Okay, so it's able to, to figure out, okay, this is a, this plus sign, this plus sign, because I know both of these values are numbers. Okay, I know that's, that's definitely it. Now, that's fine, but sometimes you're going to get values from off of the HTML. So really what you, what you typically would do would do something like this. And all this is doing is the parse int is a built-in function that takes whatever x is, and if it if it's a string, I'm implicitly saying this is a number, this is an integer. So take that string and turn it into an integer. Okay, does that make sense? That's how you avoid accidental concatenation. All right. You can also use parse float. Which, for those of you who don't know, parse float is basically a decimal. Basically just a decimal number. So if I wanted to say x was 8.3, that's what we call a float. Okay? So without the float, what would it do? If, let's say you this would be fine, but if I did this, right, if I did this type of thing, It's very confusing. It doesn't know what to make of that. Eight point three nine. That doesn't make any sense, but it does if you realize that this is a string. So we're saying string concatenate the number. It concatenates. It doesn't add. Mm -hmm. It can get really confusing, so you have to be very, very careful that you understand concatenation versus addition. All right? I want to check on Q&A here real quick, guys. What are some JavaScript resources for both books online that you recommend to become JavaScript Jedi Masters? I like w3schools.com. W3schools.com is a very good place to go to check it out. They also have a lot of HTML tutorials and stuff like that. But, of course, the best resource is to come to Coder Camps. I mean, that's like a no-brainer, right? You come get me all 24-7, right? Uh, no, not 100%. Oh, yeah, the application fee is waived if you enroll within, the last, within 24 hours. So the application fee is free. If you guys want to join up at Coder Camps, there's typically an application fee, but we're going to waive it since you guys are attending. Also, did you guys know that you guys get a $1,500 discount for attending today? If you want to join Coder Camps, your scholarship, $1,500 off that scholarship if you guys sign up. So just because you guys attended. Uh, how can you show us the finished code? Or can I show you the finished code? Uh, I will hopefully get there in time. I'm taking a long time to explain a lot of this stuff, but I think it's important to do. Okay. We're getting close to the end, though, I promise. I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit here. Arrays store multiple values in one variable. You can declare a, a variable, or an array, using the new array, and you can just pass in the values that you want for the array. This is their parameters, right? Or these are arguments. Value one, value two, whatever the values are that you want to assign to that array, you just pass them in to those parentheses. Okay, and then you declare with the total number of items. You can you can also create an array by declaring the total number of items that are going to contain. So you could say new array is going to have three items in it. 
And you can also declare an array literal, where you use these open and closed straight brackets. Thank you so much for coming. I hope to see you guys again. We're going to do more of these, so you guys are more than welcome to attend. Hopefully, we'll have the AC situation figured out by then, too. OK, so my array is equal to, uh-oh, did I just say equal to? Oh, darn it. It's assigned the value of this array with red, blue, and green inside of it. Notice that I'm not declaring any properties on that array. I'm just passing it some values. But I'm using these straight brackets. Then you can retrieve using the value index, and the value index starts at zero. And what I mean by that is that, for example, if I declare this array up here of var my array, and just ignore the fact that I forgot the semicolon, just, just ignore that I'm a totally bad coder, uh, my array one will return blue. Hmm. But that's one. Why isn't it returning the first one? Zero is the first position within the array. So zero, one, two. Now when you're declaring an array using this syntax, new array three, that actually means I want three spots within this array. So there's red, blue, and green. I want to declare there's three spots, but when I reference those values, I start with zero. Okay? And you can also assign the specific indexes using the same syntax. So for example, my array two is assigned the value yellow. So that will change green to yellow. Everybody got that? Let's just do this real quick. I'm gonna to try to make this a little speedier. Bar my array of num assigned a value of, I don't know, let's do uh, three, six, and nine. Now I can do my array of num. I'm going to take the first value and I'm going to add it to the third value in my array. What will this do? 12. Which that seems right. 3 plus 9 is 12. Okay. I can also go in here and I can change this. So I can say my array of num. And I'm going to specify that actually the second or third value in my array is actually going to be 16. So I'm just basically assigning to that position in my array a new value. So instead of 9, I'm changing it to 16. Save that. Run this. 19. Because 3 plus 16 is 19. All right. What symbol do you use to combine two strings together? Plus. 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 Concatenate. <laughs> you got it. Concatenate. What are the different ways to declare an array? Mm -hmm. What are different ways to declare an array? You do. When you declare an array, then the. What's that name? No, There we go. So you can declare using new array and pass in the values just like that. Mm -hmm. You can declare an array this way with where you're actually assigning the values right away. Or you can declare using new array and then how many values you want to have in that array. So I could do something like this. That's the same thing. I could also do this. Okay. 
So I'm assigning the zero position, the zero index of my array. I'm, well, first I'm declaring up here an array that has three spots in it. The first spot, index zero, I'm assigning the value five. And on the third value, I'm assigning 16. I'm leaving the second one just completely empty. There's nothing to find there at all. But this will still work because I'm only alerting on those two things. So if I run this, what do you want? Okay. Uh, moving on, moving on. Control flow. Managing the results of, of an operation based on specific conditions. A control flow, there are several control flow mechanisms. They're kind of grouped into a, either a decision tree, which is if, else, and else, if, or a switch statement. These are what we call uh, control flow mechanisms. They're a decision tree. If this is this, then do this. Otherwise, do this. Okay. There's also other control flow mechanisms that are called looping like while, do, and for, okay? So decision tree, if, else, and else if. So if an expression is true, then do something if the condition is true. Else if, if let's take a second expression, some other expression, and if it's true, but the first one is false, so do something if, expression, that's this one here, if that's false, so that's not true, but this expression is true, then do the code here. Does that make sense? And then finally, if neither of those two conditions are true, then just do something else. Do something if none of the expressions are true. So. If true equals true, do this. Oops. What's that going to do? Hello world, because true is equal to true. I could say if five equals five, is that going to be true? Is that going to alert Holo World? By golly, it does. Five is equal to five. Is five greater than or equal to five? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Is five less than five? Mm -hmm. So, nothing. Nothing happens. Okay, so it's checking to see if this expression is true. If it's not, it'll move on to this else if that I'm going to write right now. And if neither of these two things are correct, so else is just kind of a catch all, right? If this is not true, and this is not true, then do this. Does that make sense? So do this. If it's true, then do this function here. So 
If 5 is equal to 5, and I have that correct, what's going to pop up? Hello world. Because 5 is equal to 5, so it'll do that logic. Make sense? None of the other alerts popped up. Because what was true in the if statement was correct. There's no need to run the other code. Okay. Let's move on to switches. Switch operand. This is just basically another root word expression. Like what we do is five less than or equal to five. If it's true, oh wait, no, that's not correct at all. Wait a minute. Case operand two. Hmm. So if operand one is equal to operand two, do this code. So code to run if operand one and operand two are equal. Notice that I have this break. And also notice that case has a colon. Not a semicolon, it is a colon. The semicolon comes after break. Okay? We can have multiple operands to compare the first operand against. So we have this value up here is checking to see. Is it equal to the operand 2? If not, then go down to operand 3. Is that true? If it's true, then run this code. If it's not equal to 2 and it's not equal to 3, then run this stuff in operand 4. Kind of the same thing we just did with if, else, if, and else, right? Kind of the same thing. Just a little different expression. So here we'll do this. Switch. I'm going to actually create a variable here. You must put the break in after each case statement, okay? Now I'm going to add one other thing in here, and that is false. So what do you suppose is going to happen here? I have a my value equals or the sign the value of seven, right? It's going to look at this and it's going to say, is my value equal to 5? If so, then alert hello world. But it's not true. So it's going to move on down to the next one. And that's still not true. It's not equal to 3. Check here. Oh, wait, there it is. Alert. And then break out of the switch. So this break keyword here means I'm done. Don't evaluate the switch anymore. OK? Let's just run this real quick. Hello, Washington. Now, what if I change this value to 8? Nothing to show. The default is basically the catch-all. It's just like the else statement that we made. The default means if it's none of those things, then do this. So you can see how if else else if statements are 
basically the same thing as switch statements. It's just a completely different way of switching up the syntax, the way it reads, whichever is more preferable to you, which way looks better to you. Okay? There's some cases where it just makes more sense to do this kind of switch statement. It's just easier to do that way. Okay? All right, now let's see. I have some questions. And you have multiple else if scenarios. Yes, you can have as many else if statements as you want. Just like you can have as many case statements as you want. Okay. You got chat going on. I have to go to dinner. I understand, Davin. <laughs> Form everyone about the new about the glorious color of your new paint job. I just see her apples. Okay, all right, good. I think we're all caught up there. All righty. Hawk, when is, when is code within an else if block run? When is code within an else if block run? If all the preceding ifs and else ifs before it are false, then that block of code inside of that else if will run. Okay? Oops. Why would you use a switch statement instead of an if else else if statement? Anybody want to tackle that? This is kind of more of a, I don't know, existential question. Yes? I thought you have a lot of cases or a lot of different possibilities. Okay, yeah. Sometimes it's just more about how readable is something going to be if I use the else if versus the switch. Okay. There's also some cases, especially if you're using, um, um, uh, come on now, all of a sudden my mind is drawing a blank. Enumerators, enums. Uh, if you're using an enum, you'll often see a, a case or a switch case statement used with enums. Uh, what keyword must be used at the end of each case code block? Break. Break. Now, there is an exception to this. There is an exception to this. If you're returning, if you're returning a value, you don't need to call break after it because return is a keyword that actually exits out of the function entirely. It stops whatever you're doing inside the function, return that value, and it breaks the function. It's done. It stops the whole thing. Whatever is inside the code of that function, use the return keyword, it exits out of the entire function. If that's the case, there's no need for the word, word break. Because why would you return, you're done with the function, now break? You're already done with the function. You're already done with the switch statement, so you don't need to call break. Okay. We're going to hop into some loops now, the while loop. You can say expression equals true. So while the expression is true, you run the code inside of these open and closed curly braces. Simply looks like this. If something is true, run the code. Is it still true? 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 Run the code. Okay, you guys get the idea? Now what do you suppose would happen if I forget to give it some reason to return false? It will run forever. So, be sure there is a reason the loop will exit. Yes. Your browser will just go, ah. Okay? So, be sure there is a reason the loop will exit. So here's an example. Bar x equals 1, while x is less than 10, write to the document x. And now increase x. Now, plus plus x is a shorthand way of saying increase the value of this by 1. It's just a shorthand syntax. This is like saying x equals x plus 1. This is a shorthand version of doing that. Plus plus x means whatever the value of x is, add 1 to it. Okay? So by putting this plus plus x here, I am ensuring that x will eventually be greater than 10, so that this will eventually evaluate to false. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. A do while loop 
is similar to a while loop, but code is performed at least once. Okay, so we do something, do, now code to perform, and while the expression is true, do it again. So this is kind of the same loop, except now we say, run the code. Okay, now if it's true, run the code. Okay, now if it's true, run the code. Now if it's true. So at least we get one time that the code runs. And if the expression is still true, then run it again. If it's still true, run it again. It's a little different. It's the only difference between a do while and a while. The only difference. But again, be sure there is a reason the loop will exit. This will cause an infinite loop if you do not do this. So var x equals 1, do, write document, increase x by 1, now evaluate while x is less than or equal to 10. Okay? For the sake of brevity, I'm going to kind of skip forward here a little bit, guys. I'm not going to sit down and write code, but I typically would. I'm going to go right to the for loop. It's a similar syntax to while loops, but it's kind of a, a, a what we call syntactic sugar. Makes this somewhat complicated way that we constantly write something and just kind of makes it a little simpler and more condensed. And a for loop basically has statement one, expression, statement two. So code to run each time the expression is true. So we've got this for. We've got parenthesis, open and close parenthesis, and we have three different statements in here, basically. Statement one, an expression, and a statement two. So every time the expression is true, it's going to loop. Okay? Every time the expression is true, it's going to loop. Now, what's different about this? The first thing that happens in a for loop is that we run statement one. It's going to happen. First thing that happens, run statement one. Now, evaluate the expression. If it's true, run the code. After you're done running the code, do statement two. Then check again. If it's still true, run the code. Execute the second statement. If true, run the code. Now this one looks something like this, and it's so small, I'm gonna go ahead and write this out here. So I'll quickly write a, a while loop here. Var x, I'm going to assign it the value of 0. While x is less than or equal to 10, document.write, the value of x to the document. And now we need to increase x by 1. Now I can do this one of two ways. I can either do x plus plus, or I can do plus x. Uh, plus plus x. Either way, it basically does the same thing. There is a minor difference here. I'm not going to get into it just right now, but you can do it either way. X plus plus is probably the most common way you'll see it, though. Now, if I run this, zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, ten. All right, ten. Now. If I do this as a do while, do, I'll stick the while down here. Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, not much difference there. The only real difference is that it writes there first. Okay, it writes to it first. Uh, did I do that right? I don't think I did that. Try that one more time. Yeah, okay, good. All right. So all that a for loop does is let's go back to this while expression written like this. A for loop, I'm going to write exactly the same code, but I'm going to use a for loop. One is simpler. Seven. 
Which one is easier to read, you think? Both of them do exactly the same thing. One shorter. While. You think the while is easier to read? I'll tell you what, it's, it's totally a, a personal preference thing. It certainly is. If you like to have more expanded what exactly is going on, you can certainly use the while loop. But the for loop is just a shorter, smaller syntax. It's doing exactly the same thing. There's my declaration of the variable x. In my loop, there's variable declaration of x equals to zero, or assign the value zero. Gosh, i got to stop saying that. <laughs> While x is less than or equal to 10, there's my less than or equal to 10. Now, at the end of the document write, inside of the code block, I would write x plus plus, but with the for loop, it's being more explicit. x plus plus. And then document dot write. Which one do you think is more likely to, to cause an infinite loop if you forget something? Why? It's going to be easier to forget here, I think. You might forget to declare that x plus plus part. Here, it's kind of required. you got to add that third line. Mode. It's kind of hard. Right? So it's really a matter of personal preference, but I've seen this cause an infinite loop far more than a for loop. Just out in the real world, this is the preferred way of doing it. Yeah. That means I'm doing my job. <laughs> All right. I'm going to skip the pop quiz. Who wants a cup? Who wants a water bottle? <laughs> no water bottle. All right. Good job on the quiz, man. All right. <laughs> We're getting really down to the last parts here, guys. Um, we're going to start talking about the document object model, which is where JavaScript really shines. Now we're talking interaction with the HTML objects, the stuff, the, the buttons, the, the pictures, the images, all that stuff I can actually interact with with JavaScript. And now we're starting to talk about that stuff. The DOM, document object model. It's the object-oriented model structure or tree of the page being displayed. So you can think of this as all the HTML elements inside of the web page. That's what the document object model is. It's basically all of the HTML elements inside of the web page. The document is the root object of the DOM. Document is the root object of the DOM. And we've used documents several times. When I write document.write, Document is the root object. On this web page, this document, I want to write the value of x. And so it writes the value of x to the document. Okay, so document is the root object of the DOM. So there we have our document. Inside of the document, we have our HTML tags, right? Remember that? So we had our document, the doc type equals h or doc type HTML. There's our HTML tag. Then we have our head tag and we have our body tag, right? So here's our head element and our body element. Inside of the head element, we have a title. Inside of the body, we might have a header one and a paragraph, okay? So inside the head, we have, head, we have these titles. I should I remember I have this thing here, so the people online can watch. I have a document, I have the HTML tags inside of the HTML, I have head and title, and then I have body H1 and P. So inside my body elements, this is basically walking up and down the DOM. This is what we call walking up and down the DOM. We're walking down the DOM by going from the document to the HTML to the body to the lower tags. Okay? We can walk up the DOM by going from P to body to HTML to document. Each one of these places is called a node, okay? It's called a node. It's a node of the DOM. Did you get your picture in, by the way? Everybody get, I think we got some pictures. Okay, good. Selecting elements. Document object has several methods to locate an object. 
So the document object, that's the top level root object, has methods on it that allow us to locate some item, some object underneath it. Okay? One of those ways is get element by ID. And the get element ID method returns a single item. You can also do get elements by class name, which returns an array of items. And you can do get elements by tag name, which returns an array of items. You got to head out. Yeah. Thanks for joining us, man. Just let it. If are you if you're interested in joining us, you know, at Coder Camps, man, just uh, talk to I think Autumn's still out there. All right. So we're going to return these objects from the DOM, one or an array. We're going to get one item or we're going to get an array. If we're getting it by the ID, then we're only going to return a single item. But if we're going to get it by class name or tag name, then we're going to get a whole array of things. Okay? Items have properties that can be retrieved or changed. So on one of these items that return, gets returned, like a, say a div or a paragraph, or a H1 header. You can have the inner HTML you can access. You can access the style. You can access the source for certain items, like the JavaScript, like the script tag. But if you want a complete list, because there's a lot of them, you're going to want to go to this URL, www.w3schools.com forward slash jsref forward slash dom underscore obj obj underscore all dot asp. This is going to give you basically all of the properties that you can inspect on any one of these items. Now, let's do this. I want to show you guys real quick what I am talking about. Let's take, uh, let's do H1. I'm going to give this an ID. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my document object. I'm going to declare a variable here called first header. This is a JavaScript. You know what? Just to make this a little bit more clear, my first h1 uh, is going to be document get Element by ID. You heading out too, man? Yeah. All right. Thanks for stopping by. Yes, sir. We're starting to dwindle down here. I'm sad to see everybody go. Everybody got their pizza and drinks. Now they're splitting on me. <laughs> Did you have fun? Yeah, for sure. Good, good, good. Oh, that'd be great. It'd be great to have you, man. So now I'm going to go get this H1 tag that's in my DOM. Okay, in my document object model, in my document, I'm going to grab this h1 tag by using this get element ID. I'm going to pass in the ID that I've assigned to it right here, first header. Now I can manipulate this. I'm going to say the inner HTML, I'm going to assign it a new value my first editor darn it so if i just comment this out for right now i'm just going to comment this out so we can see what initially it would look like all this is going to say is just first header right but now if i take this and i take out The comments now my JavaScript is active and I saved it. If I just refresh this page here, my first header darn it. So I'm actually able to modify the elements on my page and able to change what is on there using JavaScript. This is the power of JavaScript. I can make decisions.
So it says first header. My first header gone. Are you guys starting to see the power of what JavaScript can do now? Yeah. We've gone over what two, two and a half hours worth of oh, almost three hours, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> Seems like we've been here for a long time. <laughs> We've gone over a lot of things here in JavaScript, but I think you guys can see here by doing this, I'm able to call a function, right? I'm calling a function. That function is able to go get an element on the document and change a value of that. That is the power of JavaScript. That's why we are here. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, my bad, sorry, sorry, sorry. You guys want this, the code? Is that what you want? Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah, we're going to have to wrap it up here, guys. I'm sorry that we haven't really gotten into the, the image stuff, but this is where I would suggest that you guys really start exploring is being able to do this, getting the elements by ID. And then you can also do stuff like uh, if we were to give this, so let's say uh, <laughs> oh, forgot to grab something here. <clears throat> um, Bar my H one. So I have two headers here, one called first header, one called my second header. When I click on the button, it's going to call the change header function. Here I'm declaring a variable that gets all of the H1 objects and returns it as an array. Okay, so this variable, my H1s, is an array of these two H1 objects. Now, for each one of them, I'm going to change the inner HTML to my first header garment. And then as long as that evaluates to true, which dot length is to find out how many or how many values are in the array. Dot length tells you how many, gives you a number of how many values are in the array. So this is going to return true. So as long as X is less than two, Okay, then go ahead and run this code. Here, take the picture, and then I'm going to run it. Got it? Okay. Oops. So right now, my we have first header, my second header. If I click me, it changes both headers to my first header on it. Okay. All right. I think I'm going to call it quits after that. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. If you have any questions about joining us here at Clover Camps.